real YouTube is. Oh no, went to Japan only now. Have they come home? Wow. Uh, I don't want. I don't want a single comment about it. I don't want a single comment about that. You keep whatever thought you just had, whatever you scroll down there and type type a comment with your little fingers. You keep that to yourself. That's your own business. You. I don't want. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Anyway, hello. Uh, I'm back from Japan, and today we're going to be talking about the World Championships, or at least one aspect of the World Championships, which is uh, some of the controversy that happened. Um, because I think it's important to talk about. Um, and yeah, I wasn't able to do it sooner because I was in Japan. So we'll talk about it now. So I kind of have three main categories of um. Controversy might be a stronger word for some of them, but things things that like um, were discussions during the World Championships, and we're gonna start go from like I think least contentious to most. I don't know if you even know if contentious is the, is the right word to use there. Oh, I didn't check to make sure this was gonna work. Hang on, uh, one second. Um, cool. So, oh, it works. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. So first of all, World Championships. I'm gonna have a full video coming out on like my 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 journey within uh, Worlds at a later date. Um, a much later date because I haven't started working on it and it will take quite a while to script and edit. I always feel like this is too low. Um, but for now, we're going to talk about some of the other stuff. So kind of one of the main themes, and there were a couple different examples of this, but I chose James's thread here because I think it's pretty articulate and um, it kind of exemplifies a lot of the issues, of, like the issues of this aspect of worlds. Um, we're around, I want to say like logistical aspects. So well, let's go through James's uh, thread here, and you'll um, you'll get an idea of kind of what to expect. Um, James, for anyone who doesn't know, is a very very good competitive player. He's a teammate of mine on Beast Coast, and he's not a complainer. Like there are people who are complainers and will kind of complain when given an opportunity. I can't ever remember James complaining about something. He's very good natured, and I think he very much like he's just a very good natured guy uh, and he's not a complainer so for him to kind of make a thread like this it's not it's like it's meaningful at least to me as someone who knows james because it's like he wouldn't be making a thread if he like unless things were actually pretty bad so basically the thread goes like this um he went to worlds uh he wants to talk about kind of what happened and he says it's one of the worst managed world championships ever held from a player's perspective which we'll come back to that um check off check in and pokemon center line so for anyone who doesn't know, um, the check-in lines for Worlds typically takes, I don't know, like, let's say, I feel like an hour, maybe, maybe two hours. Two hours would be pretty ridiculous. It should take less than an hour. I don't think I've ever waited in line an hour to check in um, for the World Championships. This year, I was one of the first people through, or like one of the earlier people through, and I think it took me about three hours. Um, and a lot of that uh, waiting time, almost all of that waiting time was outside in 90 degree humid weather, at least 90 degree humid weather. Um, really hot, really, really hot, uh, situation. And some people were waiting for like four or five hours. The only reason I was able to get through quicker was because my friends anticipated that it might be a longer wait this year. And so to counteract that we got in line, I think two or three hours before like registration even opened. So it opened at 5 PM. I think we got in line around like two or between two and three. I don't remember exactly. I actually think it was closer to two. And then no, it must have been closer to three, and then we were through by like at like six, six thirty p.m. Probably that's like probably a rough timeline. But for anyone who got in line at like five or six, they might have been there till like between eight, nine, maybe. I don't think anyone was there till ten, but I don't know. I was through early, right? So, um, this is a pretty big deal because keep in mind that check-in is only open the day before world starts. Um, and so like that's the night before the tournament, and you have people waiting outside in line until let's say eight or nine p.m., which means like finding dinner and getting like sleep before the tournament is going to be pretty difficult. So, um, James talks about that here. Uh, also they made an error where they didn't give him his festival paradise card, which is the special promo card you get for being a competitor of the world championship. Um, and he had to go back through to get them, which these cards are pretty valuable. I think that like some years they sell for like, they should always sell for at least a couple hundred dollars. And I think that there might be years where they sell for, I don't know, closer to a thousand. I'm not positive about these numbers, but, but at the very least they should be selling for, they, they have the ability at, at one point in time to sell for at least a couple hundred dollars, which is not an insignificant amount of money by any means, especially given how expensive Worlds is. Um, this is something unique to James, though. Like, maybe not unique to James, but this is this is something that I didn't personally experience. So James showed up at 8.45 uh, a.m. thinking that he probably had till, I think, 9.30 is when play was supposed to start. Um, um, several friends who went ahead of uh, him had told him that there were separate lines for competitors that were quick to go through. Um, 
and for whatever reason he wasn't able to go through these lines and was instead redirected to a line of mostly spectators instead um it took five minutes just to get to the other line but he also wasn't um able to he wasn't let in here too and basically this goes on for quite a while where they um tell him to go back where he came from <laughs> and that's where he needed to be um and he wasn't able to explain himself because they couldn't really speak english so he kind of just has to go back and forth for 25 minutes and like every time getting denied entry like via the same speech until he finally just decides to go through the spectator line even though he's a competitor um and this is all outside in the 90 plus degree heat uh and humid weather um talks about being sweaty Be I, I have never been so sweaty in my entire life than i was in japan like i live in dc dc is pretty like i don't know if it's notorious for having bad weather but between you and me the weather is really bad japan was like comparable uh it was really bad like i there was a time this is a tangent um there was a time where i was outside for a while sorry let me let me i can do this in a smoother way there was a point when i was in japan where i got outside and kind of like a not a flash flood but a quick downpour right i got totally soaked and i came back like to change clothes and the clothes that had been soaked in the rain were less wet than the clothes that i had worn the day prior like just wet with my sweat so it's it's really hot like i run i run warm in general i'm a, I'm a sweaty guy uh but yeah like the heat was really bad and to be doing this the morning of the world championships is like really really bad like uh like this is like it was already bad when like the heat was bad enough when i like there was no like additional pressure of competing to do this to like have to deal with it the morning of worlds is really really bad and he gets in eventually but it's like five minutes before he has to play which like is not enough time to like cool down and like it's you know like center yourself and get in the right headspace not to mention having to deal with all the additional like stress of feeling like you're going to miss the tournament despite being at the tournament I, I can't even imagine um he like because of this understandably he didn't like he wasn't happy with his play in the first round um and yeah like didn't have a performance that he was happy with um and it wasn't just the result that um that was the problem it's like ugh. yeah the circumstances basically um <sighs> let's see here um other competitors also had plenty of problems throughout the event and communication was generally terrible um and that it wasn't like a japan issue it was a world issue specifically james talks about how he went to other uh events in japan and like didn't have any issues there um and uh yes and it's so bad keep in mind that by the way keep in mind for anyone who doesn't know james placed top four at both of the prior world championships which is a, a tremendous accomplishment in 2019 top four and then again in 2022 there was no 2020 or 2021 because of the pandemic so for james be saying basically here that um if worlds ends up being a total organization organizational disaster like this one was he might consider not competing is shocking because this is one of the best players in the entire world um and you know talks about here how it's not like the judges are on the ground organizers fault it's just um yeah poor planning logistical management and uh bad communication from higher ups and then yeah outside parties like security um yeah so that's the first thing so basically james the reason i wanted to go through this whole thread is because i think what james is talking about is like not a symptom of a broader problem but one problem of a broader symptom that's not right um but basically <sighs> i've been playing in world championships since 2011 i have played in every world championship since 2011 and i would agree that this world championships were like from an organizational standpoint like uh, and a logistical standpoint alone by far and away the worst um like we talked about the line we talked about like issues with players getting in and that kind of was just a theme throughout everything where like nothing really went smoothly nothing worked the way that it should and, and on the whole i think that like worlds this year was i think a big source of the problem was the fact that it was in japan and Pokemon is extremely popular in Japan. So even though the, the venue was not, I thought the venue might be kind of like, I don't know, small, like I didn't really know what to expect, but it wasn't like there wasn't space for a general tournament. It was just that it was too popular. Like there were too many people. And like when you have a system where there are far too many, like people, there's too many people for what you like plan for or design for, I don't know. It just like didn't work. And so James's like issues are not unique to James. He's like, one player out of um quite a few who had different types of issues at the world championships and they all in my opinion revolved around logist not all of this category for the most part revolved around logistics and planning um so it's unfortunate because like yeah like uh i don't know like the world championships is something like really special and and 
yeah, like I th uh, there's a pretty general sentiment uh, throughout players that like this world was kind of, I don't want to say a disaster organizationally, but like uh, there were pretty like non-trivial problems. I think Pokemon players in general like to complain. Maybe that's just people in general. I don't think that these complaints are complaining to complain. I think that a lot of these complaints are really like valid uh like and really affected people's tournaments um in a major way and that's not like good obviously like to have a player like james who we know is capable of finishing at the semi-finals in the world championships to have a player like james feel which i think is valid personally like feel like the these things outside of his control affected his world run i believe him like honestly like i mean i i totally i totally believe him i actually played james um in day one of the world championships and his team was very solid and very scary and so also, losing that first round in particular has a like can have a cas uh, cascading effect because I don't need to get into it. Losing the first, even if it only affected his first round, that still is enough to affect his entire tournament. Um, and I I totally believe that like having to wait outside and having the stress of feeling like you're not going to be able to play or you might like get a penalty for being late. Um, yeah, like I I can I absolutely believe that that would have affected his ability to play the game, and that's that's not cool in my opinion. That's not great. Okay. Topic number one, that's, we're going to put a little, a little bow on that, which is just overall planning and logistics did not go very well at the world championships for the most part. Um, number two, this one is, I mean, I don't have a hot take on this, but this is something like, like this is really bad. So basically there were a lot of tweets about this, but I, I chose just to focus on Emilio's here. Um, Amelia was about, but by Amelia's words, they were about to win in their top 16, uh, set against Maddie, but they DC'd in an auto win position for Emilio, never playing this game again. So, um, what, I, what happened here? Every single top 16 match with maybe the exception of a stream match, I'm not entirely sure, but the majority of the top 16 matches that were still going on after a certain point all disconnected at once. I was not able to figure out the cause of this. Something similar actually happened I think the prior year in the junior division where like I think a parent unplugged a like cable or like went to plug something in or unplug something and it caused every single switch that was on that power strip to disconnect and something similar I don't know again I don't know the cause for it but every single top 16 match disconnected at the same time um in in the world championships which is a huge a huge deal Pokemon does not have the ability to reset to a game state that is not I mean, we, we don't even really have a functional spectator mode. Oh, apparently we do, actually. I shouldn't say that because, you know. But regardless, we don't have... There's no way to reset to a game state. So if you and I are playing a game and, like, there's a disconnect and something happens, there is no way to recreate to get to that point. Which put the judges in a, in a bit of a tricky situation. Um, and I don't know if... I assume that what they did is what was, like, called in the rule book. This is a situation where, like, no one's going to be... No one's going to be happy no matter the result, but the call that they ended up making, um, which I believe is probably the call that uh, is like recommend, like is it says, it says it should be in the rule book, is that the players were sent to a sudden death where basically a game was ruled as a tie, um, so or a draw or a null, um, but it wasn't as if it didn't happen. So let me explain this because it's a little confusing. If you were playing a set and you're playing a best of three and something happens during one of the games that causes it to become null, almost always that's going to be a disconnect. Um, if it's one, like if it's uh, one to one where, you know, you've each won a game and you're in game three, um, or if you've won a game and then your opponent wins the next game, you don't then play another game. Um, you don't, you don't recreate like and play a third game. What happens is you play something called sudden death. So uh, sudden death works. The ruling, I need to be careful with my language here. Sudden death happens when, sorry, sudden death happens in the circumstances that we listed where a ju judge will rule it typically in the case of a disconnect. Um, and the way that it works is at the end of every turn, if a player has a Pokemon lead, that player wins. So it's kind of like first to lose a Pokemon loses, but it's first to lose a Pokemon, first to have a Pokemon lead wins. It's not like, like, so if there's a game and, you know, I knock out one of your Pokemon and in the same turn you knock out one of my Pokemon, sudden death continues. Um, the thing is that sudden death is only ever used in very, very sparing circumstances. I think in my life, I've only had to do it once. It was this season, but maybe I'm forgetting, but like, it's not common. Like, and, and it's not something that you would ever build your team, um, with that in mind. And some teams are a lot better equipped to handle sudden death than others. A team that is 
like offensive in nature and has Pokemon like Chen Pao or Chiyu or most notably Urshifu, um, Urshifu being very relevant because of his ability to hit through Protect, those teams will have a massive, massive advantage in Sudden Death over teams that don't have those tools or play a more like bulky play style. Um, yeah, it's very, very, very different than a normal game of Pokemon. Why does Sudden Death exist, right? Like, that's a good question, because it's not it's not similar to other types of Pokemon. Um, we could probably go back to full screen for this now that I've explained. It's not similar to other types of Pokemon. It's not, it's not, it's, and it only comes up in very rare circumstances. And the reason for Sudden Death's existence, in my opinion, if I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm speaking as a guess here, but I think it's probably an educated guess, if nothing else, is that let's say this is happening in a lower pressure scenario where like there was one game that disconnected at a tournament. It's like the Swiss rounds. There's a thousand people in the tournament. Um, the thing about Pokemon it uses a Swiss format and Swiss, uh, is unlike, uh, like other, like, I don't know, fighting game tournaments, which typically use, to my understanding, double elimination brackets in that you cannot start the next round of a tournament until the current round has finished. And so sudden death is great when it's like less of a high pressure environment. It can still affect those two players, but it, it prevents like an additional up to 20 minute delay of the entire tournament, potentially even more because you had to have time to call a judge over and get a ruling, et cetera, et cetera. So in those instances, I think sudden death makes sense where it's like, if we do not end this game about the same, like with about the same amount of time as other games, we're going to add a lot of time to the overall tournament. And I think in those cases, sudden death makes sense. The, the thing is, there isn't anything in the rule book to state like for when sudden death isn't applicable because it's not, it's not supposed to happen. Like this only happens when there is a disconnect pretty much. Maybe there's other possibilities, but it pretty much only happens when there's a disconnect and like, it's not like they have, you know, multiple different contingency plans for every like aspect of when a disconnect can happen. Moreover, this happened to a multiple, multiple games. I think it was at least of the eight top 16 games. I would say it probably happened to at least three, if not four, if not five. Um, it was a, it was, it's a like major, 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 major deal. And it absolutely changed the course of the tournament. Emilio, um, felt they were in a winning position. I think that like their opponent might contend that it wasn't like guaranteed i don't think that they were contending that it wasn't a good position but um that's not really relevant here right it, what matters is that like that was not the the tournament was affected in a, in a pretty in a pretty major way and there were other uh matches as well i remember i don't remember who i was watching i think it was actually the player who would go to, on to finish uh second michael um and i think i was watching their their set as well if i'm not much mistaken go to sudden death and it it could have played out differently you know what i mean like sudden death is so different than any other type of pokemon that like the odds of it not affecting the outcome of any of those matches, in my opinion, is very small. And of course, it, like, even if the outcome would have been the same, the players have no way of knowing that. Even if, you know, Amelia would have lost, like, that's almost irrelevant because it's, because, like, they didn't get the chance to lose on their own, right? They were, they were, um, kind of robbed and definitely robbed, in my opinion, of, of their chance to make it to, like, the, uh, quarterfinals of the tournament because it's something totally out of their control. It's not like the player's fault that everything disconnected. Again, I don't know what caused it, but it, it wasn't the play. If, in a worst case scenario, it would be one of the player's fault uh, and not all of them. And I don't think it's likely that it was any of their faults based on the way that things are set up. So it's pretty bad in my opinion. Um, it's, it's really, 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 really bad. Um, and it totally like it's, it might not have affected the overall um, like finish of the tournament, but it, probably affected some of the standings and it definitely affected how players feel about it. And I don't want to say it invalidates anything. Cause I don't think that I would like, I don't think that a player who made top eight because like they're like of this disconnect is any less deserving of that spot personally, but it still feels bad for, for, for everyone involved. You, because if you, if you are a player who like, I don't know, maybe you feel like you benefited from this disconnect and then, um, you know, then you, like, I don't know, maybe there's like some additional, like, I don't know, like it just like, it adds all this, like, Sorry, I'm not being very um, eloquent here. It adds a whole lot of mess to this situation, which shouldn't have had any of it, right? Um, and without knowing what caused the disconnect, it's hard to really be like, I don't want to speculate because I, I really have no idea. Like it, it could have been somebody bumping a plug. Like I, I'm sure it wasn't intentional, um, but you know, like, I don't know. I think that there needs to be maybe better hardware in place to prevent this from happening. Like I, I don't, it's really hard to say solutions without knowing what caused it, right? I, I think it was likely a hardware issue but I don't know that for sure. Um, I, I, I really don't. So yeah, it overall, it's just a really bad situation where nobody wins. Um, and, and I think that's really unfortunate because worlds is like, again, such a Worlds is the pinnacle of, of, you know, com uh, each competitive player's year for the most part and to have it be affected to have like so many matches, so many crucial matches be affected by something like this. 
I think is really unfortunate. And I wish that the judges here had made a different call. I don't blame them for making the call that was in the rule book. In fact, I don't even know if they were able to make a different call than the one in the rule book with so much like on the line. But again, I do think that the, the purpose of sudden death is to prevent tournaments from going on like too long, especially during Swiss rounds. And I think in this case, like it would have been okay to add an extra half hour to the schedule, which I mean, things were already running really late. So maybe, you know, as someone who's not actually involved in the, the organizational uh, side of, of the tournament, maybe it's, it's certainly a lot easier for me to say that than, you know, for somebody on the floor making the decision. But if possible, I think that would have, I think at least allowing them to play a like full game three would have been a better solution here than forcing them into sudden death. Because although they save some time, like, in a, in, a, in a like in the case where the game is just like not counted at all rather than ruled as a draw which is what happened here like at least the players have a chance to like fully play out another game it still leaves their fate more or less in their hands whereas playing a totally different effectively a different format right like sudden death is so different from regular um competitive pokemon that like it's effectively its own separate thing i think that that makes it feel even worse like of course the results still could have you know been changed because of a just because of you know players being in a winning position and then having to replay or like, I don't know, maybe like making mid set adjustments, et cetera, et cetera. Like it still wouldn't have been ideal, but I think it would have been better. So I don't know. Like I don't fault the judges at all. It's a, I'm grateful that I was not put into the position where I had to make that, uh, that call. But I, I definitely think that like, I don't know. It, I think that a replay rather than a sudden death would have been a replay of game three, uh, rather than a sudden death ruling would have been better for the players if, if not better for them. I mean obviously not better for the schedule but better for the players and I think that as a player that's what I personally value so let's wrap that one up um <clears throat> and then we have the third topic which is the most controversial hmm. by far I actually had some tweets pulled up but I think I'm not going to show them just um yeah I don't think I'm going to show them here which basically is that at this year's world championships there were a record number of disqualifications for players using hacked Pokemon. Um, I'm going to move a little slower through this one because I, I want to be careful because I think that I think that when talking about this subject, it's for some reason very contentious within Pokemon. Well, not for some reason. Um, I know why. Basically, I think that there are more or less two bad actors in the space who um, I think that there are two bad actors in the Pokemon, you know, Pokemon space broadly, who, maybe there are more, at least two, um, who basically their primary way of remaining relevant is by, uh, like, instigating bad faith discussion around this topic, and because of, like, because it's their way of staying relevant, it's like, uh, things are kind of sensationalized, things are taken out of context, and things are not really represented fairly, because that's not in their own best interest, so I want to be careful with what I say here, because, um, yeah, like I don't think I will not be, I could, you know, I will not be given the benefit of the doubt. I will not be interpreted fairly. I will be given the worst faith interpretation. So, I mean, it's going to happen anyway, but like I may as well try and be, try and be at least precise with my words so that most people can pick apart what I'm trying to say. So, okay, what exactly happened here and what is a hacked Pokemon? Let's start from that. So, there, um, there is a program that I believe is, Unless they've changed it recently, I believe it's... I Actually, you don't need the name. You don't need the name. Uh, it's not relevant here. There is a program that allows players to generate Pokemon um, with the correct stats, items, moves, etc. that they want into their game. Um, and this is commonly referred to as hacking or genning a Pokemon. So um, it's worth noting that these Pokemon are not stronger. They don't give you any kind of competitive advantage in the game. Um, but they, they can be like generated without grinding for them without without going through the process of actually getting them and there are players who compete in uh official tournaments who use these pokemon now this is the first kind of i think difficult part of the discussion which is that this is not cheating it is hacking it is it is, it is against the rules but it is not cheating it does not give you an unfair advantage these pokemon are not stronger in any way they're not like i don't know better equipped for the uh for the for the tournament the only difference between a Pokemon that is generated and the Pokemon that has been obtained legitimately um, is in the time that it took to get them. But once they're in the actual tournament, no, no meaningful, di no difference at all. Um, this is against the rules, however. And so if you do choose to use a Pokemon that has been hacked into the game, you're always risking disqualification. Oh, I guess I should probably be, just for the sake of completeness, I should be a little bit more um, uh, 
should go a little deeper before we move on. So I say this is not cheating because it does not give you an unfair advantage. The Pokemon that are used are the exact same. Full disclosure, by the way, I get all my own Pokemon. I do not hack in my Pokemon. There have been times, for sake of transparency, sake of like being fully honest, there have been times in the past where I have used Pokemon that were traded to me that I believed were legitimate. And in the past, some of those Pokemon probably weren't. Um, even though I trusted the people, like the only way that I can be sure that my Pokemon uh, are all legitimately obtained or if is it like if I get them myself um and yeah like if you trade for any Pokemon then there's a chance that they might not be legit but yeah like I do not knowingly bring Pokemon uh that are oops my bad uh I get all my own Pokemon and I do it all myself just to make absolutely sure in the past there have been times where I have been traded to Pokemon that was not legitimate but um I have never been I have never been disqualified from an event I have never even lost a Pokemon from an event due to a hack check so um yeah i think that like a record of over 10 plus years speaks for itself so this isn't something that i personally benefit from if anything it actually is quite problematic i'd rather that like it just wasn't possible to hack in these pokemon because again bad faith actors as well as the fact that like it would just make things a lot like like i don't care if people hack in their pokemon personally to be honest like it doesn't affect me um however like there's so much bad faith discussion around this topic that uh yeah like it would be easier if, if it wasn't possible but it is possible with that out of the way, the reason why I say that it's not an unfair advantage is because the thing that like hacking in a Pokemon saves is time, which is not relevant in the actual tournament itself. And if you want to argue that like, I don't know, like the time that you save by hacking in a Pokemon versus like getting it legitimately is an unfair advantage. I think that you have to take a step back and think like, is it an unfair advantage in competitive Pokemon to be unemployed? Like as the person who, um, I don't know, works 80 hours a week and, and hacks in their Pokemon, do they have an unfair advantage over the person who, I don't know, is like, off for the summer not doing anything and get all their pokemon legitimately right i don't think that you can police people's time and i don't think that that's an even starting resource to begin with and so i think that to argue that it's an unfair advantage to generate um pokemon that were like not obtained legitimately i think it's i think it's a really bad faith argument it also yeah like i mean we don't need to go any deeper than that that's my opinion it's not it's not factual it's just what i think i don't think that like hacking in your pokemon gives you an unfair advantage by any means um personally and i still despite that choose to get on my pokemon um legitimately because i don't ever want to risk disqualification because i work really hard to prepare for tournaments and to not like get the pokemon themselves to me seems like uh, an unnecessary risk especially because i don't know how to hack pokemon myself and so therefore i would always be risking uh disqualification because i wouldn't know even how to do it properly so with that being said this year at the world championships it was announced that pokemon's hack check was maybe not announced officially but it was basically uh said like told distributed in advance that the hack check was a lot more advanced that they, they'd managed to upgrade the quality of the hack check and so in the past whereas pokemon that were like not obtained legitimately but were like totally fine in terms of their stats items moves etc like it wasn't like they had a pikachu with you know 999 speed or whatever um these pokemon would pass the hack check this year it was said like we're not telling you exactly what but the hack check is going to be more strict um and that's what was that's what was said and for you know my friends and i it didn't really matter because like we were not going to risk it anyway um just because like there's no in my opinion there's no point but a lot of players either didn't like know about the warning or didn't really realize how um intense the hack check was going to be for whatever reason they still chose to bring pokemon that were obtained not legitimately to the tournament and there were a lot of disqualifications um i don't really need to focus on any one person in particular because I don't see the point in that um but yeah there were a lot a lot of disqualifications and many players were very very upset about it so i think that this is a take that's not going to make anybody happy to be honest i think that the vgc players aren't going to be happy with with my stance and i, I think that the um more oh this is also something worth noting which is that people a lot of the discussion around this topic comes from people who do not play competitively in fact i within the competitive community it's pretty broadly accepted that like using like uh pokemon that were not obtained via normal gameplay means it's like it's not ideal but I, I don't think anyone nobody within the community views it as an unfair advantage people view it as hacking but they don't do it at they don't view it as cheating not not that everybody does it again because many people like myself either don't know how or don't want to risk it which i think is like the stance of quite a few people in the community but um a lot of the people who feel that this is very morally wrong do not play in tournaments in fact it's almost all of them do not play in tournaments we have more to say on this later but that's another um that's a point for later so um my stance that's going to make nobody happy which is that 
I think that like it's it's unfortunate that you know so many players got disqualified at the same time like we were warned you know what I mean like we were we were given a heads up and like I think it, it like I mean it sucks that players got disqualified but like at the same time every time you bring a hacked Pokemon to a tournament you were risking disqualification and like I think that it's unfortunate for people to like have to learn the lesson at Worlds but I think that like it's a lesson to be learned which is that like the only way you can ensure that you're not going to get disqualified is to not bring the hacked Pokemon, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not maybe not as sympathetic as people would like me to be, but like, I don't know, like it's it is against the rules. I don't think it's an unfair advantage, but it is against the rules, and so you like if you choose to bring hacked Pokemon, you are risking um, disqualification at, at any event. And even though it hasn't really happened like that much for specific types of hacked Pokemon in the past, you're still risking it. And and I think that was a risk that people should have been aware of, and like. Yeah, I mean, it sucks. I, I feel bad for the players who were disqualified, but, like, there was a warning, and I don't know, like, it's, like, I don't want to say it's on you because I think that that's really unempathetic, but I think that I think that it's a lesson to be learned. I think I think that, like, you know, whenever you choose to bring hacked Pokemon to a tournament, you're risking this, so, like, maybe don't bring hacked Pokemon to a tournament if you care about, you know, if, if you're not willing to take the risk, right? especially to the world championships, which I think for many of us who are competing is a tournament that we care deeply about. So that, that's my take on that. But, but there is a broader point here, actually. Which is, wh why do so many players choose to hack on their Pokemon? Why were there so... I mean, there were so many disqualifications because a lot of players chose... Okay, also, like, when I say so many, it wasn't in the hundreds. I think maybe it was, like... I don't really know. I want to say maybe, like, around 20 people, which is still a lot, like, for sure, but... It wasn't like half the field or anything. We weren't, you know, like it wasn't like that. But um, yeah, like, uh, yeah, it wasn't like, I, I lost my train of thought. It wasn't, that, it was it was enough people that it was a lot more than normal. It was not like the entire field, just to be clear. <sighs> um, broader point here, which is that why are players choosing the hack on their Pokemon? Are they, are they lazy? Are they like super risk takey, right? And the answer is that Pokemon at the moment is not accessible. In fact, uh, maybe accessible is the wrong word. In order to get a team of competitive Pokemon legitimately is a not only super time consuming um, endeavor, um, it's also an expensive one. So for the most part, for Scott, like each game has gotten better when it comes to accessibility in terms of getting the Pokemon that you want easily. Um, for my world's team, it took me probably about three hours, if that, to get everything like fully um, like ready to go granted i caught a lot of the pokemon already but like basically for the most part games have gotten better and better every single year at like helping you get the pokemon legitimately without too much headache um there were some small steps backwards in recent years but for the most part it's far 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 easier now um to get a to get a team of legitimately obtained pokemon without too much headache what i for anyone curious as to how i recommend doing this if you stockpile resources at some point i typically do this when the game comes out just like grind raids like do a ton of stuff etc etc like get all the in-game resources um you'll pretty much be set for a whole year and then each year you might have to refresh a little bit i'm actually in this stage right now i am fully out of grass water and steel terra shards so uh, i have been fighting many raids but that's not really the point right you stockpile resources and for most pokemon in the game you can then pretty easily get them trained up you can affect their stats to make them higher um you can change their natures ev training is very easy uh, in my opinion and then if you have like in-game currency, like the actual money or whatever, which you've grinded, then you can get most other things pretty easily in terms of the held items. So that, that takes care of all that stuff. And if we were playing on the same rule set that we started Scarlet and Violet with, I don't think that there would be really any excuse for hacking into your Pokemon because everything would be pretty accessible. The problem is that there are a lot of Pokemon that you cannot obtain in Scarlet and Violet that are dominating the format. Pokemon like Urshifu, Pokemon like Landorus, Pokemon like... Or Saluna, right? These are all Pokemon that you need an, an external game for. And for example, if you want to use a team with like, I don't know, like Enamorous, or let's say you want to use Ursaluna, Cresselia, Urshifu, um, and then three Pokemon that are native to Scarlet and Violet, you would need um, not only a copy of Scarlet and Violet, that's 60 bucks, you would need Sword and Shield, another 60 bucks, you would need the DLC, 30 bucks, you would also need Legends Arceus, another 60 bucks. Not to mention the fact that like, Travel is expensive. Entering a tournament, tournament uh, fees have gone up astronomically. When I entered, they were when I started playing, they were free to enter. Then they jumped to twenty bucks, then twenty five, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Entering a tournament now costs you seventy dollars. Not to mention the cost of a switch. Not to mention 
uh for bigger tournaments you know they start on a friday and, and even for smaller tournaments like maybe you have to like take off work for a day either on friday or on sunday or on monday excuse me to get back home pokemon is is unfortunately a very expensive hobby and one of the ways around this of course is if it were easier to get the pokemon in the game um and when pokemon that you um you know like want to like the when the best competitive pokemon are pokemon that aren't even native to the game it forces players to either spend a lot of money like a lot of additional money to get them not to mention time um or to to hack them in right and so i think when you look at it through this lens um yeah it, it becomes a lot more understandable as to why players would choose to do this not to mention not all pokemon are easy to like most pokemon can um be obtained without too much trouble but there are a couple exceptions like so I talked about Urshifu and Landorus and like Cresselia and all those Pokemon can be caught if you've beaten, by the way, you have to beat most of these games in order to actually get to the point where you can like catch these Pokemon. So let's say you're a player who's like, uh, you know, gone back and, and you know, be, you, you beat Sword and Shield, you beat the DLC, you beat Legends RCS. And now you have these legendaries that you can use. Two problems, by the way, that we're going to get to after this. But um, there are some Pokemon that that aren't so easy to obtain. Like, so for Pokemon, like some Pokemon want lower stats, which is a problem because um they're kind of hard to obtain with lower stats and there's no way to lower the stats now for the most part this isn't a huge problem like Cresselia is a pokemon that often wants zero um attack like as, as low attack as possible sometimes it also wants as low as speed as possible which is pretty hard to get it's like a one in two times like two one in 15 so it's like it could take you like a couple days to get a good Cresselia though once you have one you should be good um for the most part but there are some pokemon uh that are almost impossible not impossible but are extremely difficult to obtain legitimately one of the key ones is enamorous um with enamorous basically the problem with enamorous is that enamorous you can only catch once per game in legends arceus you can only catch it after you've beaten pretty much the entire game and on top of that um in order to, to like maximally use enamorous you ideally want a zero attack iv and a zero speed iv each I actually don't know how ivs work in legends arceus because i didn't have to use any of them but let's let's be generous and say each is a one in 15 chance roughly or one in 16 chance roughly bear with me um that enamorous is only like it doesn't if you like run into enamorous catch it don't like the stats reset like reset back to like the home screen because you didn't save that will not work enamorous stats are set when you i think when you load into the game um at the very least it's once per save file and so if you're an average player, every time they want to have a chance of catching an Enamorous with zero attack and zero speed IV, um, they have to replay the entire game. And that is, like, not really fair to expect players to do. Not to mention, basically, trading is off-limits. There was a player who um, always uses legitimate Pokemon. Like, it takes a lot of pride in it. And they were disqualified from the World Championships because a Cresselia that they'd been using since, I want to say Diamond and Pearl, like, basically, like, their childhood Cresselia that they traded for from, like, a beloved friend ended up being hacked they'd use this thing at multiple tournaments over multiple years like never had any reason to um to, to suspect whether or not like to even consider that it might be hacked they found out by being disqualified from the world championships that it was hacked and they were so distraught that they're giving away their entire like legitimately obtained shiny uh pokemon decks and they're quitting the game because they were so upset about that which brings me to another point there's no way to tell if a pokemon is hacked this is a huge problem there's no uh way to identify so basically that like that works against competitive players because if i have traded for a pokemon and i want to know whether it's legitimate or not the only way i can do that is basically by like hiring a, a hacker who can tell like you know can tell me whether or not it's hacked in the first place it's completely unintuitive like so players who know the least about hacking have absolutely no chance a lot of the stuff the way that you tell a pokemon is hacked they're not looking at data that's publicly publicly visible they're looking at like did this Pokemon, how, did it get like the little token it gets when it transfers through Pokemon Home? This stuff is not publicly available. You can't see this in the Pokemon summary. You need to have external software. So basically because of that, you have no, as a player, you have no way of knowing whether any of your Pokemon are hacked if you've traded for them. So the only way you can guarantee that a Pokemon is legitimate is if you, is if you get it yourself, which again requires potentially playing through um, a ton of extra games and spending a ton of extra money. One second. Excuse me. Um, on top of that, the, the, there's a main issue. A lot of the, the um, problems with these Pokemon come in legendary Pokemon because they're only available once per game, right? And because of that, 
let's say I want to use Cresselia at a tournament, right? And it's like, I want to use, I don't know, like Icy Wind, you know, Cresselia without Trick Room. I catch my Cresselia, I make sure it has zero attack IV. Um, and I'm like, great, this is this rocks, I got my Cresselia. And then later on in the season, I want to use Cresselia again. Um, only now I want to use one with Trick Room and I want it to have zero speed IV. I need to play through an entire extra game to get this again. Um, if not to like, if, if not just like buy a new, I guess you wouldn't need to not buy a new game. You'd need to basically like start a new save file and play through the entire game again, and then go through the trouble of catching an entirely different Cresselia again, which again can take, if you're unlucky, can take a couple days, um, to get a Pokemon with, with the two like lowest IVs, um, which is, you know, oftentimes important in competitive play. So basically all this to say it's not that competitive players are evil. It's not that they're lazy. It's that the ask for competitive players, which basically they recommended the world championships. I think, ex I believe explicitly, they said, they basically said, do not trade. So this game about trading and like, you know, catching Pokemon with your friends, not to mention not, not every Pokemon's even available in every game. So all the costs that I mentioned, you might have to double it because you might need both copies, right? Like if you want to use a Pokemon that's native to Scarlet and you have, and you have Violet, you got to buy a whole extra game. So you're potentially looking at Scarlet, Violet, Sword, Shield, DLC. DLC in both. You could easily use both Regieleki and Regidrago, right? And then on top of that, wait, Scarlet, Violet, Sword, Shield, DLC in both, and then Legends Arceus. That's seven games, six games in one DLC. Not to mention we're going to have Scarlet and Violet DLC. That's about to be relevant. So six games, two DLC for, uh, what is that? Over 400 bucks plus the cost of the Switch plus the cost of competing. It's like very expensive not to mention the hours constraint right like not everybody has unlimited time you know like not everybody can afford to like play through what is that in theory you, do, you could have to play through as much as six games and is that right i think i counted wrong sword shield scarlet violet legend rc is sorry five games plus two dlcs plus about to be four dlcs with the, with the new with the new um dlc stuff right um I don't know it's it's, it's to, to play through for a single tournament and then you might have to do it all again at least for some of them to play through for for your next tournament if you want different stats on on your legendary pokemon so i think the real thing here is that the game needs to be more accessible there needs to be a way to lower the ivies of pokemon when they're caught or after they're caught because that's the real thing holding players back if we were able to like lower ivies i think that it would be a lot easier i mean you'd still have to like buy all these games and play through all the games but if you weren't fixed at static ivies when you um when you like when you caught a pokemon if you could actually lower them i think it would fix a lot of issues within um like within the competitive scenes accessibility right like of course it would be really nice if like all the pokemon like were easier to obtain right like that would be great but i don't think that's a realistic ask like that's basically being like bring back national decks which isn't really my take personally um i don't know the, the whole thing is kind of messy and kind of tricky and i don't know if i explain all my points as eloquently as I would have liked to, but I hope this makes some sense, right? It's not that players are like looking to hack in Pokemon because, you know, they're like evil and scheming or anything. It's that accessibility is really bad. It's really hard. And you know, I'm lucky in that, like, this is my job. So I can justify like, oh, like I need to take today to like train up my team or like reset for a Chi Yu, right? Like it's like, I can justify that, but not everyone has unlimited free time, right? Um, not, not everybody. I don't know. And so like, basically it makes me sad to think that there are people out there who can't really compete in competitive pokemon not because they aren't good enough but because it's so hard to get the pokemon legitimately right and so i understand why players choose to hack on their pokemon even though i don't do it myself um because it is so hard right and of course like as things stand i think if you're playing competitive pokemon you shouldn't be hacking in your pokemon just because like you're always risking disqualification and like that alone is enough to not do it but it would be great if players didn't feel like they had to choose between, I don't know, like hacking in their Pokemon or sinking like 40 hours of work into a single team, right? It shouldn't take that long, but with bad luck resetting, if you want like specific stuff, if you want like, I don't know, like if you haven't already beaten these games, it's a lot of extra work. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm sure that this is going to be taken out of context and, and argued in a really negative, uh, uh, bad faith. It's a bad faith too many times. Um, but my brain's a little off, so to forgive me, bad faith direction. But I don't know. I feel like it's important to talk about. I feel like a lot of the discussions around genning and hacking in Pokemon are just so reductive and so like just not really. I'm so sorry. I wish I was better with words right now. I'm really fried. Uh, but I hope. I think you. I hope you. You get what I'm trying to say here. I really. I really tried to approach this with like general grace and like general. I don't know. Like caution. I. I, I really tried to like do this in a way that was proper. 
I don't know if I succeeded, but I, I hope that I hope that some of you at least like understand that this is a more complex issue than it's often made out to be, and that like ultimately it's the player's responsibility. It's the player's responsibility to bring Pokemon that are legitimate. But it would be really great if players didn't feel like they had. It'd be great. It'd be great if it was easier to get Pokemon, right? If it was easier to get legitimate Pokemon, that would be great for everybody. The Pokemon company doesn't like disqualifying people. Players don't like being disqualified, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. It would be it would be really great if it were if it were easier, right? And like, if it doesn't get easier, then players will have to like just kind of suck it up. And like again, I recommend in free time just getting resources when you can, because like hopefully people at some point have the free time. But yeah, I don't know. It's it's not. It's not easy right now, and I, I I do understand why players would choose to hack their Pokemon um personally because it's hard. It's it's and it's a huge time sink. So, oh man, I don't even know if I should. I mean, I'm gonna post this, but I I I have some misgivings as to whether or not it's a good idea. So, I don't know, man. Like I'm doing my best over here. I like I think I think it's important to talk about. I think it's a hard topic to discuss. I like it's gonna be a pain to like see it's just everything get reduced to such. I don't know, out of context, clipped, whatever, um, aspects of this, but I did my best and I, I hope there's some rational people out there who can take this for what it is, which is like my attempt at a good faith discussion around the topic. So, um, that's it for me. I don't know. I'll probably get some blowback for this, but it is what it is. Hope you all are doing well. Um, I hope to do, I have, a, I have a couple more bonus wolf things planned. Also big announcement coming soon. Eh, medium sized announcement. Small announcement coming soon, but if you want more wolf content, big announcement for you people, because there's a lot of old content is coming back in a form, and I don't know, maybe some other stuff too. Okay, I'm done. That's it. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Don't don't be. Please don't be toxic online for either side. Please, please. It's it's just it's just a game. Why you have to be mad? Please, please. Can we can we just once have a good faith discussion? Can we have a good discussion just once? We don't even have to discuss it. You guys don't have to leave comments. I'm gonna disable comments in this video. Bye bye.